Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tiho. Today I'm going to be covering my first ever female killer case and I'm really excited. It's quite hard to find female killers just because females don't kill for the same reasons that men kill for so they're usually not in the media. Men kill for things like sexual gratification whereas women kill for things like insurance money or a cheating partner and it's not to say that men also don't kill for the same reasons it's just less likely to find them killing for the same reasons that women kill for i hope that makes sense <laughs> so with that let's go straight into the case today i'm going to be covering the case of daisy Dabalka. it's a very famous case it happened in the early 1900s towards like the mid 1900s so i hope you guys like it so daisy Dabalka born Daisy Hancorn Smith, was born on the 1st of June 1886 at Seven Fountains near Grahamstown and she was one of 11 children. When she was 12 years old she moved to Bulawayo, Rhodesia which is now known as Zimbabwe and moved in with her father and two of her older brothers. About three years later, when she was 15 years old, she went to Cape Town and became a boarder at Good Hope Seminary School. In 1903, once she had finished school, she moved back to Rhodesia and she really didn't enjoy it. She found it just really unexciting. It was just like real life for her. The same thing, like the same thing every day. And she just really didn't want that. So she decided to move back to South Africa and this is when she went to Durban and enrolled in the Biera Nursing School. Daisy would still go to Rhodesia to go visit her father as well as her siblings. You know, during her holidays, she would go there, travel back and forth. And it was during one of these many holidays that she met her first love, Herbert Fuller. Herbert, but most people called him Bert, so I'll be calling him Bert. Bert was a civil servant in the Native Affairs Department and they planned on getting married in October 1907. Unfortunately, they wouldn't see this day as Bert contracted black water fever, which is usually just a result of a malaria infection and usually results in kidney failure. So unfortunately, they couldn't get married and on the day that was meant to be their wedding day, Bert unfortunately passed away. And he left a hundred pounds for Daisy in his will, which is about two point one two thousand rands, two thousand one rands. In March nineteen o nine, about two years after Bert had passed away, Daisy got married to a plumber. His name was William Alfred Cowell. At this time, Daisy was twenty three years old, and William was thirty six. They had five children, four of whom unfortunately passed away. They had twins who died in infancy. They had a child who contracted um, liver abscess, if I'm not mistaken. And they had another child who made it until 15 months. Also, this was the early 1900s and medicine wasn't as advanced as it is today. So it really wasn't... Um, out of the ordinary for children not to make it past infancy or a certain age. Fortunately, they did have one child and they decided to name him Rhodes Sissel and he was born in June 1911. In the early morning of the 11th of January 1923, William Cowell fell sick and this was after Daisy had given him some Epsom salts. And Daisy then called a doctor and the first doctor came and said that William wasn't like severely sick. It wasn't anything that bad and just gave him some cough mixture, you know, just hoping that he'd feel better. Unfortunately, after the first doctor left, William's health rapidly decreased. And after this, Daisy went to the neighbors and called them over, hoping that they could help her. And she also called a second doctor. And once the second doctor got there, things were just worse for William. He didn't like it when anybody touched him. As soon as they touched him, he would just scream out in pain. His face was blue and he was foaming in the mouth. 
William was like this until he passed away and the second doctor refused to sign the death certificate as he noticed that the symptoms were symptoms of scritonine poisoning. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. So basically scritonine is a colorless crystal like powder and is exceptionally bitter in taste the poison causes the muscles of the back to go into spasms it causes convulsions so intense that the body just aches violently and eventually these muscle tensions prevent the lungs from working and death will either be a result of respiratory failure or exhaustion and this usually happens within an hour an autopsy was performed and the cause of death for William was said to be nephrotic nephrotitis and cerebral hemorrhaging. And after this, Daisy inherited about a thousand one thousand seven hundred and fifty pounds, which is approximately thirty thousand thirty seven thousand six hundred and fifty rands, if I'm not mistaken. Three years later, when Daisy was 36, she married her second husband, Robert Sprout. Robert Sprout also happened to be a plumber and he was 10 years her senior. In October 1927, Robert fell violently ill and he exhibited the same symptoms that William had before he died. But fortunately, Robert would survive this attack. But a couple of weeks later, on the 16th of November 1927, he was with Daisy as well as her only surviving son, Rhodes, and he drank some beer. And after this, he fell violently ill once again, but this time he wouldn't survive. William's cause of death was said to be aristerylisiosis, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, as well as cerebral hemorrhaging, but no autopsy was ever performed on him. After Robert's death, Daisy inherited £4,000 as well as an additional £560 from his pension fund, which is about 96,000 rands. Four years on the 21st of January 1931, Daisy married her third husband, Sidney Clarence DeMalka, who also happened to be a plumber just like William as well as Robert. I don't know if she just has a thing for plumbers or she attracts plumbers, but it seems like she has a type. Just like Daisy, Sydney was also a widower and he had one daughter. Her name was Elian Damalka. I hope I'm pronouncing it properly. I'll put it down below. So when Daisy married Sydney, her only surviving son, Rose, was 19 years old at the time. And I can't imagine having had his third stepfather in a span of like over two decades. But that was his life and I'm sure he was probably just used to it. And um, people describe him as a really good person. He was bright. He was a real gentleman. However, his stepsister, Elian, said that he was lazy. He really just didn't care for anyone but himself. He wouldn't wake up early in the morning to work. So it was like two contradictory statements about who Rhodes was. But also he was 19. So, I mean... You could expect him not to want to wake up early in the morning to work. It's just a usual thing. And it just seemed like Elian really didn't like him. But other people really liked him and thought he was overall a good person. In late February 1932, Daisy traveled from Grahamstown to Turfontaine to buy some arson. And she used her second husband's surname. So her third surname, Sprout. Um, instead of the surname that she currently had, which was Damalka, so she could buy that arson and she planned on killing her son, Rhodes. So there's many reasons as to why she would have like she would have wanted to kill Rhodes, but it's really not known why, because she only inherited about a hundred pounds after he died from his life insurance, which is only about two thousand one hundred rands. So it's really not that much in comparison to um her first husband and her second husband, like how much he got from that some people also say that she thought Rose was just disrespectful and didn't appreciate her much so it's just very conflicting stories as to why she murdered Rose 
but she did less than a week after daisy had bought this arson on the 2nd of march 1932 she made rose some coffee for when he went to work and she put this arson in the coffee so he went to work and shared it with a co-worker james webster fortunately james only took a couple of sips as compared to rose and he recovered after a couple of days but unfortunately the next day on the 3rd of march 1932 rose Cecil passed away so around the same time william sprout robert sprout's brother who was daisy's second husband became really suspicious of her because three people had died in her company in a span of like two decades so he just really was concerned and very suspicious so he decided to go to the authorities and the authorities shared the same concern that William shared so they decided to exhume the bodies of William Cowell, Robert Sprout as well as Rhodes Cecil Cowell. Rhodes body was the first one to be exhumed and his body was pretty well preserved it wasn't that decomposed which is usually an indication of someone that has been poisoned with arsenic so that was the first indication that his death wasn't a natural death which um, the doctors at the hospital had assumed and after that Robert's body as well as William's body was ex were exhumed and their bones had like a pinkish discoloration which is usually a sign of someone that had been poisoned by strike nine so that also wasn't an indication of someone that had died naturally a week later daisy damalka was arrested for the murder of all three men and after this the press were just having a field day everyone was covering this case and daisy damalka was labeled as a serial killer and because she was in the news all the time the person that sold her the arsenic on um in late february of 1932 saw these things and saw her name in the news but obviously she had used her second husband's surname sprout instead of damalka but he still realized that it was the same lady and went to the authorities and he also later testified in court as a witness to daisy having bought arsenic like literally far away from the town that she was living in at the time so daisy's trial lasted about 30 days and obviously it had a lot of media attention and daisy just really felt like put in a corner so around this time in the early 1900s the south african law wasn't the same as it is today so the defendant could either choose to have a normal court case court hearing with a judge and a jury or they could decide to have a judge as well as two assessors so because daisy felt as though she was highly scrutinized by the press she decided to have her trial with a judge and two assessors instead of with a jury so during the trial the judge said that the state had been unable to prove that daisy had murdered robert sprout as well as william cowell and um, beyond reasonable doubt but he said that he found her guilty of having murdered her son rhodes cecil cowell and after that she was found guilty and sentenced to hanging but before this the judge asked if she had anything to say and all daisy said was i'm not guilty of poisoning my son on the morning of the 30th of december 1932 daisy damalka was hanged and that is it for this week's case. If you guys found it interesting, please leave a comment down below. Or if you guys want me to cover any other cases, please leave a comment down below with your suggestions. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.